Hi, I'm Terry Marr. We've been talking about the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Today we're going to continue that on His Alone. We've been talking about the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Last week, we talked about the importance of also knowing that we have to have the kind of character of God that allows whatever the Holy Spirit does through us, that the character of God will shine beyond that, that people will see God in us, not so much the gift. Men or the world will target in on the gift that you have or what it is that they can get from that gift or how they can market that gift. But we as the sons of God have to go beyond that. We have to be wise enough. We have to have the wisdom and understanding and knowledge of the Word of God to understand the scripture that says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are not to be marketed. They are to be used for the kingdom, that the power of God will be manifested in the earth. And that's what we want to discuss today. All things are working together for the good of those who love the Lord. Everything happens in sections, in increments. God does not automatically, though there are so many times we want him to just anoint us. We'll come, go to the altar and we'll fall on our knees and say, Lord, give it to me. I want all, all that you have for me. But what are you really saying? Can you really handle everything God has for you at that very moment? There are all kinds of things that God has got to do to prepare us. For he's God. He knows things about us we don't know about ourselves. That's why the Holy Spirit is with us. He takes us step by step, moment by moment. And He teaches us not only about the Father, but He shows us ourselves through the eyes of the Father. Our character is so important to God. We need to know what it is God knows about us. And in order to do that, we've got to spend more and more time with God. The story of Moses in the book of Exodus talks about how Moses had 40 years that he lived in Egypt. And he had 40 years that he was on the backside of the desert. But then he had 40 years that he was in the wilderness. And each of those 40-year sections in his life, those experiences for each of the 40 years were necessary for him. Each part was important before the next part started. What is going on in your life right now? You You may say, nothing's going on. I'm just bored, nothing's happening. If you are seeking God, something is happening. You are changing, not because because you feel it, but because that's the way God is. You have to be able to trust God to the point that no matter whether you sense or feel anything, you have to know if God has ordained this time for you, whether it's a time of isolation, whether it's a time of training, where there's a time of teaching, where it's a time of of just um, being on a job, going through day-by-day situations. Whatever it is that God has got you doing, because you belong to Him, it's necessary. And you must pass this part before you go to the next part. Moses, we know the Bible talks about how during the time he was born, how the Pharaoh wanted the children, all the younger children, boy children, killed 
at that time. He wanted them destroyed. They were not to live. God fixed it for Moses' parents to be strong enough and courageous enough to save him alive. And then when he gets to the point that he begins to feel destiny, then God says it's time for him to move on out of Egypt. He had to learn the ways of Egypt, but it was a time when he had to leave Egypt because Egypt was not to teach him the things God had to teach him. He had to learn about Egypt, but he had to know God. So he goes to the backside of the des desert for another 40 years, and it just seems like maybe to him it was isolation. I'm back here taking care of this, these uh, animals, and I don't know, you know why God's got me here. What's this about? And he didn't know that much about God. But the time came when God says, now I'm ready for you. And you can hear God telling you that right now. There's a time when God says, today is the day that I begin to draw you. Remember the scripture we talked about? No man can come into Jesus except the Father first draw him. Moses had to be drawn. And when he began to be drawn by God, God drew him up to this mountain, to a burning bush, that he had to do a double take. Why is the bush burning, but not burning up? And while he was on that mountain, day after day after day, Moses was up there listening as God was doing all the talking. God would tell Moses things like, I need you to know who I am. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God who will send you back to Egypt so that you can be the deliverer of the people for the people are crying out. He was telling Moses things that Moses had no idea. How in the world can you get this out of me when I still feel like an Egyptian myself? But God knew what he was doing. God had already declared who Moses was, what he would end up doing, and how he was the chosen one. Not only was he called, he was the chosen one. And once he was chosen, his job was to stay up on that mountain until the Father released him. Moses sat on that mountain and he listened to God. And I told, I was preaching this some time ago and I told one person, I said, if I were God, I think I would have fired Moses right there on the spot because no matter what God said to him, Moses spent all of his time telling God, well, I can't do that. Don't you understand? I can't talk. I have a stutter. I don't know as much as my brother Aaron. You shouldn't call him. He's the smart one. You should call my sister Miriam. They know about these things. I don't know anything. He spent so much time telling God why he was not the right one for the job. And I used to think, you know, God, you're so patient. You put up with us telling you all these crazy things. But what I didn't know then that I know now is that all of this was deliberate. God needed Moses to stay on that mountain so long that he got all of his questions out, but also that he was able to hear the voice of God so readily that no matter what are the voices, he would hear from that moment on, he stayed on that mountain so long that he could differentiate God's voice from all other voices. It was deliberate. The time you spend with God, whether you get a, a tingle down your spine or not, it's so that God can make sure you know his voice beyond all other voices that you know his call above all other calls. He wants you to know when he's the one who's calling. He wants you to know his ways. He wants you to know his word. He wants you to get into the word of God, the Bible so deeply that you will know his voice because it will 
mirror, it's a mirror image of what he wrote. Remember I told you before, God speaks like he writes. He wants you to know how he writes. So when he calls and begins to speak to you, you will have no doubt that that's him. You know, that's my father calling. Those are my father's words. You must know the father's mind. You must be able to speak the father's words. And like the song says, you must be able to come in the name of the Lord. God has purpose. The purpose for Moses going on that mountain for that length of time was for him to become so familiar with the voice of God that when he showed up in Egypt, when he showed up in the wilderness, and all these people were screaming out, saying, why did you come and take us from uh, a place that we know and take us out into this wilderness to, not, to die? That Moses, in the midst of all that squabbling and screaming and fussing and complaining, that he could hear God say, Moses, stretch out your rod over the Red Sea. The time has come for the children to cross over. Moses heard that. The wind was blowing. The dust was everywhere. The people were crying out. But yet, when God spoke, Moses heard God say, this giant, you will see no more. God has a plan for what he's doing. Don't be discouraged if you don't see what you think you should see when you think you should see it. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. But we are his children. And he is our God. As a Christian, you may be aware of the journey of life you must navigate through day by day. But as a son of God, are you aware of the Father who has ordered each step, making it specific to your needs and his expectations for your growth and success along the way? Through Terry Marr's new book, Searching the Depths of God, you will discover that every step is deliberate and necessary for you to become the answer to the problems of this planet. With each chapter of her book, you will discover your role in this epic adventure called life and strengthen your resolve to please the Father while recognizing He is so much greater, powerful, wiser, and transcendent than you could ever imagine. Call the number on your screen now or visit terrymarministries.org to get your copy of this amazing book today. Now back to His Alone with Terry Marr. Today we've been talking about the importance of Moses understanding why every part of his life was important. For 40 years, he had to deal with Egypt. For 40 years, he was on the backside of the mountain talking to God. And then for 40 years, he was in the wilderness. All of those things were important. All of those things were needed. But it was that part where he was in the presence of God that he was able to hear God's voice, to recognize God's plan, to be in God's presence so long that no matter what, he knew it was the voice of God and no other voice. God's doing the very same thing with us right now. He has got us in the word. He's got us in certain places in our lives where we may not feel a tingle. We may not have the mic. We may not be the one who's running things, but that part that God has allowed you to be in is important for the next part and section in your life. Last week, we were talking about the chase of the Holy Spirit and how he was drawing me and my husband and allowing us to learn more and more about him. And how after we got back from Chicago, we had seen the presence and felt the power of God. And now we're ready to implement these things that we had seen and experienced into our, the ministry God had given us. Well, it happened one Sunday morning. We were in a storefront building at the time. 
And while we were there, I used to get in early before the uh, others would show up. We didn't have a very large congregation. And I would get there early enough that I would pray in the storefront just to set the atmosphere. And I'd been seeking God ever since we'd gotten back from Chicago and that miracle, miracle crusade. I'd been seeking the face of God, asking God to anoint us. I wasn't seeking so much the gift, mind you. I was seeking God because He was showing me that He was so much more than just the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So while I was seeking the face of God that Sunday morning, for the first time, I had this vision of the hand of God showing me a gift that he had placed in his hands just for me. I didn't know how to handle something like this. I was in the church by myself, on my knees, and as he handed me this gift, I remember asking him, what is it? It was a a beautiful golden box with a golden ribbon. And it was a, a small little box. And I remember asking him, what's in the box? But God never gave me an answer. He said, he just told me, keep it dear to your heart. So I remember in this vision as I'm watching, I took it and I crushed it into my chest. I don't know why I did that. I can't give you any biblical revelation regarding that. It's just what I felt I needed to do. I took this box that I knew was a gift. I just didn't know what all it contained. I quickly, as soon as uh, my husband had gotten back, because he was driving the bus during that time, he got back with the children. We had mostly teenagers and children uh, and a few uh, young adults at the time. And as soon as everybody was in place, I started playing the organ and getting ready for the service. And my husband preached and the service went on like it normally would go. But I could not stop thinking about the gift that the Lord had shown me earlier that morning. And right after my husband had finished preaching, he was doing the altar call. And while I'm playing the organ, I heard the Lord say, I need you to trust what I'm about to say to you. He said, speak what I speak and you will see the power of God. Keep in mind, this is a faith step. We've been talking about the importance of being able to walk by faith to, in a, the presence of a God we have not seen, but we have experienced, we're experiencing him. We haven't seen his face, but we know by faith that he's there. So as God's talking to me, I stopped playing the music on the organ. I just stopped. My husband quickly looks over there at me and he says, is anything wrong? And I got the mic and for the first time, this is the very first time this had ever happened to me. I said, Pastor, the Lord has got something to say to the people. And keep in mind, as I tell you this, there are only about 20 people in the entire building. The Lord gave me five or six, I can't remember which, words of wisdom and knowledge. He gave these words to me one by one, and I stood up and I spoke each word of wisdom or knowledge out. I told them and also healings at the same time. I said, there's someone here that has been having trouble with their uh, right elbow. They're unable to straighten their elbow out. And I began to talk about it. And before I could even finish saying it, the person was standing up at the altar with tears in their eyes. I said, you know, where's this coming from? I'd never done this before. I've been seeking the presence, the face of God, but the gifts were being manifest. I had not been seeking the gifts. I'd been seeking the presence and the face of God. But yet God showed up that Sunday to show me what happens when you seek Him. So after I called that person, 
they stood up there and God gave me five or six more instances. And I said each one the way he told me. There was somebody that was having trouble with the, uh, 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 a toothache, a pain they had in their, in their mouth. That was, and I told him exactly where it was. It was in the, one of the uh, wisdom, it was a wisdom tooth in their, on the right side and their jaw had been swollen and they'd been up all night. Things I had no idea had happened. I called another person out and I told them about a knee injury. I called another person out and I told them about um, a, a letter that they had gotten that uh, from a lawyer and the lawyer was threatening to do certain things. I don't know what all God had told me to do that day, but I spoke each thing out. And the people, before I could even finish with each one, the people who God had told me to call out were standing before me. And each one had broken down in tears. We had never experienced something like this in our church, never before. We didn't know it could happen. We had been to a crusade where people were all outside the building waiting to come in because there was someone that they wanted to see. They wanted to see the one who was running the crusade be able to minister to all of those people. But yet God was letting us know that you don't have to run all over the city to go and see the power of God simply because this one man had yielded himself to the power and the presence of God. If we would yield ourselves to the power and the presence of God, we wouldn't have to jump on a plane and go across the country to experience God. You can experience God in your own backyard, but there's a price to be paid. That's what he was trying to show us. That's what he was trying to teach us. When this happened, I was so excited I mean, I was crying harder, I think, than the people who were actually up at the altar. My husband automatically went into gear and started praying for the people. And God healed each and every one of the people that came up, gave them a word that sustained them. And all things were done according to the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit that morning. People left that building that day knowing God had shown up. This went on at our little storefront in Memphis for at least three weeks in a row, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, God showed up. Then one Sunday, after about three weeks of this happening, more and more people were starting to come because they were hearing what God was doing in this little storefront. And then after three weeks of this going on, the altar call was made and God, my husband looked over there at me and said, baby, did God give you anything for today? And I'm looking panic stricken because God had not said anything to me. God had given my husband this wonderful message. He had preached it with all of his heart. The people were blessed truly. But yet now the altar call and people were looking at me because God had used me over the last three weeks to give words of wisdom and knowledge and the gifts of the spirit were moving. And they were thinking it would had something to do with what God was doing in me. And I was dumb enough to believe it as well. And I panicked that day. I looked over at my husband and I had tears in my eyes, but it wasn't because God had spoken. It was because he hadn't. And I just knew I must have done something very wrong. I remember going home and getting on my knees and getting before the Lord. And I said, Lord, what did I do wrong? Did I sin? I, I apologize. I repent. Please allow me to get it right so that I can do what you need me to do. And what God spoke to me that day, I want you to remember Because though he spoke it to me, I can hear him saying it to someone else right now. He said, it's not about you. And he said, it's not about the gifts. He said, it's about me getting the word to my people when they need it. He says, I know where you are. If they don't get it through the message, if they don't get it through the prayer, if they don't get it through the fellowship, he says, then... I will utilize you 
in the way that I see fit. God allowed me to learn that it wasn't about me, never has been, never will be. Today we've been talking about the importance of recognizing who we are as the Holy Spirit leads us into the deeper things of God. We just gave you an illustration of how important it is to know that it's not about the person. It's about our God and His will being done in our lives. Yes, God wants to use us. Yes, God has us on assignment. But the focus must never be taken off of God. It's always about Him, always about what He wants, what He has declared. He wants a relationship with us because we love Him, because we want to be with Him, not because of what we can get from Him. God does not want us to manipulate Him. He never manipulates us. He wants us to love Him just the way He loves us. Let us pray about that right now. God, in the name of Jesus, help us. Help your Holy Spirit to teach us the things of God. Help us to get out of the middle of things. Stop letting men think that we're some great person or great experience that can be marketed. Let him see that we are chosen of God and called for a time such as this, so that the world will walk away recognizing that they've seen God, that God is real, that they've seen the Father of the universe. Help us to understand they don't need to know our name. They don't need to know where we're from. All they need to know is that we belong to you. We are your people. We're the sheep of your pastor. Your will must be done. Your way has been made. Help us, God. Oh, please help us. Help us to get this right. Help us, Lord, as we look to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the power and the presence of God, and I hope our discussions have helped you as you allow the Holy Spirit to come into your life and to minister to you in the way that God has ordained for you to be ministered to. Allow Him to be real. Allow God's will to be done. And keep in mind, we're His alone.